Uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Let's all stand. Let's worship the Lord. Let's pray. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus, for meeting us here in this place. Thank you for what you have done. So go before us this morning as we worship you, Father. You deserve worship. So we, uh, Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn around and welcome everyone to our uh, Sunday service. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. All right, let's continue our worship.
Call 
my name name. and to hear you say say, well I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is love
over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Heavenly Father, your name is power, Lord God So go before us again this morning in Jesus' name Amen. Amen. All right. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up and greet somebody? Good morning. Good morning. So we start a study on spiritual warfare, and Satan takes out half the church here. So. <laughs> We'll just stop it. We'll go do something easy today. So a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into a little bit more worship. But just a reminder, this will probably be the last week we have that in there. Again, if you want to follow us just to get weekly texts and encouragement, um, reminders, then you could connect with our texting app. You don't have to download any app or anything. Just text that number or text connect to that number listed there, and you'll get on our distribution. Also, just for the, you men on your calendars, uh, we're going to have a men's breakfast, breakfast coming up in June here, June 18th on Saturday. So we'll have more information on that next week, but it'll be at a local park here, probably the one behind us, and we'll start coordinating breakfast and stuff like that, what, what you guys want, but um, we'll be meeting on the 18th in the morning. And then Wednesday night prayer, um, it's kind of more than prayer now, we're actually, get, we get into the Word, uh, and we... Uh, to get into a time of prayer, and this week we're going to start actually the book of Nehemiah, since we are talking about spiritual warfare, so we're going to go through a high-level overview of the book of Nehemiah over the next weeks and months to come, get into spiritual warfare along with many other things that are in the book of Nehemiah, a very fun book to go through. Uh, but this week we're doing something special as well, we're meeting a little early, we're going to do a potluck before, so we're meeting at 6 o'clock, so if you want to come out, uh, we're bringing the main dish is chicken. You want to come out and bring a side dish and just hang out, fellowship with us before we get into prayer and the word. Um, we'll just be fellowshipping once a month. We'll be doing that. Oh, here, Satan, let him go. The, the rest of them all came in here. No, I'm just um, and so we were just saying how spiritual warfare, half the people weren't here yet. So good to see you guys. But uh, so we're going to do potluck. So go ahead, six o'clock this Wednesday, come and join us. And then seven o'clock, we'll get into the word and prayer. So again, a good night of just fellowship. Also, our marriage ministry, we're going to pick it up in July. So this is, what is this, July 8th. Good, I thought it was the 7th. So July 8th, uh, we'll be picking up in our marriage ministry again. So just mark your calendars. It's at Frank and Nancy's house as usual. So with that, let's pray. We'll dismiss the youth, um, and you guys can go away. One last thing out front, we just have these for our, our anniversary, which was a couple weeks ago, um, keychain and a pen. And so go ahead and feel free to pick one up on the way out. Uh, just reminders of the church, you can hand them out, as well as little flyers, invitations to church we have out there stacked. Grab a few of them, and as you meet people that might need a church to go to, might not have a relationship with the Lord, hand it out to them, invite them to church, and then pray over it. So let's go ahead and pray. So Father, we do thank you again for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for this time to worship you, Lord. And Lord, again, as uh, we lift up Jesus, Lord, as Jesus is lifted up, I heard that just a minute ago, you draw all men unto yourselves. And so as we seek to lift you up through worship, Lord, draw us and everyone into your presence, Father. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time to worship and exalt you, Lord. And we just commit this service to you, Lord. We don't want to just sing songs. We want to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe. So, Lord, continue to prepare our hearts to exalt you right now. Anything that needs to be dealt with in our thoughts and our hearts, that you would just deal with those things now, Father. Uh, Lord, I just pray for those that are here, but also those that aren't here, that, Lord, you would meet and minister to them, watch over them, bless their day, Lord, reveal yourself and encourage them today, Father. Be with our children and youth as we dismiss them. I pray that you would just open yourself to them, open your word to them, just pour your love upon them, that they would know that this is their church too. This isn't just their parents' church, this is their church, and they're a part of it. Any way that they want to serve or help, however they want to use their gifts, Lord, that you would place them in the positions that you have to serve you. 
And Lord, I also just pray as we do pray for the tithes and offerings, I just pray that you would, as we give, we give as unto you. And you take that money, you give wisdom to those who have charge over it. Let it be spent exactly how you want. Let it be spent for the Great Commission. Let it be spent to share the gospel and to teach those who have received the gospel how to obey all that Christ commanded. That, Lord, discipleship would transpire here and use the finances for that purpose. So, Lord, we lift these things up to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so all the children and youth, you guys could go to your rooms, and then we'll worship the Lord a couple more songs. This is my desire. that last song.
trials and the change one thing Amen. Father God, go before us again this morning, Lord, as you continue to teach us, Father, this Sunday, that our hearts be open, our minds, Lord, uh, to just focus on you. Again, we thank you. We bring you back all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are continuing on with spiritual warfare. You guys can go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. That'll be mainly where we're at today. And uh, just one more reminder before I forget. Hopefully this won't distract you too much, but the, um, there's a fundraiser after service today for Zuli, so it's, uh, there's flyers in the back if you're interested, so it's a pasta fundraiser for her, and it's going to be over at Calvary Chapel of Downey, so um, all the proceeds there go to support her, so keep that in prayer, and if you are looking for a place to eat after, uh, that would go to a good cause. So with that, let's pray one more time as we get into the word this morning. So Father in heaven, we know you're right here. And this is important, this topic, Lord. Um, We are in a warfare, and we have an enemy who is trying to deceive us, accuse us, kill us, destroy us, ruin our lives. He's stronger than us, smarter than us. He knows more than we do, Father. Uh, has every advantage over us individually, Lord, but you've given us everything we need to defeat this enemy, to stand against this enemy, Father. And so how important it is that we understand this warfare, we understand kind of the tactics that this enemy will use, we understand what you've provided for us to stand against this enemy, Father. 
It's not complicated. That's the good news. This isn't a mystical thing. This isn't a, a complicated thing to do. But we just need to be aware and reminded of it often that we do have this enemy who's doing this. He's lying to us, trying to deceive us, twist us around, confuse us, Lord, steal our joy, steal our peace, steal our purity, steal our victory. That's his desire, Lord. I, and that's, you, you do not desire that at all. You have so much better. You've come, Lord, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but you've come to give life. And that much more abundantly, Lord. You've come to give an abundant life. Are we living the abundant life, God, or have we been stolen from? So, Lord, I pray that you would teach and instruct us. Lord, I just pray you would fill each of us with your spirit, overwhelm us, that you would teach your word, you'd open your word, that it would make sense to us, and that you would apply it in our lives. So we lift these things up to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are, again, this is part two. We're doing part three next week. We'll finish it up. And so last week, we looked at kind of the introduction. A few things we looked at last week about this warfare. One, we saw that we actually have three enemies that we have. The world that we live in, the way the world thinks, the philosophies of this world. We have our flesh which is the enemy that the Bible talks about the most. That's our greatest enemy. That's the one we, we battle with on a constant basis. And we're going to see that's what our spiritual en enemy is always trying to get to. He's trying to get us in our flesh. That's his goal. We're going to see that. So that's our real enemy. That's why we always talk about the flesh. And usually most Bible studies have this exhortation or instruction by the end as far as part of us that we need to put off or deny the old behavior, old way of thinking, and the new behavior that we're supposed to put on in its place. But today we're going to talk about the spiritual enemy um, and a little bit about that warfare that we find ourselves in. And so first thing we looked at last week is why are we in this warfare? Why are we in it to begin with? The second thing we looked at, and we'll do a short recap, is uh, the goal of the enemy. What's the enemy trying to accomplish in this warfare, and what are we trying to accomplish in this warfare? And the third thing it was a little bit about the nature of our enemy. Today, we're going to start, after we do a little recap, we're going to start on the resources God has given to us to stand against this enemy and have victory over him. And so we'll get into that this week and the following week. But first, why are we in the war warfare? We learned we're in this warfare because of the work that God has called us to. There's a great work that God has called us to in our lives, and, and that can be found. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you, but in Matthew chapter 28, the last two verses of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, this, these are the commands that Jesus gives to us, his final, not his final, but close to the end of the words that he gave to his disciples. And it applies to us. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you to do. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we are called to go make disciples. And before we can make a disciple, we have to what? Be a disciple. That's the implication there. I can't go make a disciple if I'm not one first. And here it gives us really two elements of what a disciple is. The first one is a one-time decision. The second thing is a lifelong process. The first thing is I, I have to be baptized in the name of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and we've talked, I'm not going to get into this, but that's not that we need baptism for salvation, but it's a result of salvation. And that's what it meant in the first century when, when Jesus was teaching this. So salvation, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, is the first step in becoming a disciple I can try and obey God all I want. I could read the Bible and try and do what it says. But if I don't have Jesus in my heart, if I haven't received him as my Lord and Savior, it's worthless. It's a works-based religion that, I've, that I have. And so it doesn't mean no good. I'm still going to hell. I don't have intimacy with God. I can't relate to him. So the most important thing I, could, I need to do, everyone's greatest need, is to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Be forgiven. Be filled with his spirit. Be made a new creation. Then we're given the ability to do the second thing which is to learn to obey all that Christ commanded. And Christ commanded on everything. He commanded how we're to think and speak and act, how we're to communicate, how we're to forgive, how we're to have interpersonal relationships, reconciliation. All these things are laid out in Scripture. And so 
Uh, that's the, the lifelong process. That's really what the rest of the New Testament's about, is instructing us now how to behave like who we are. We are new creations in Christ. We're children of God. And so now the Bible says you used to behave like you did because you weren't saved. You had no relationship with God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, you had no power and ability or relationship with God. So you spoke the way you did and thought the way you did and um, acted the way you did because it was all out of a selfish, self-serving nature that was opposed to God. And there's degrees of that. Some people really got into it, was really overt. Others covered it up more. But the basis of it all was we lived the way we did because we had no relationship with God. Now we receive Jesus. We become new creations filled with his spirit, children of God. And now he says, now I don't want you to behave like you did anymore. You're a new, new person. I want you to behave like who you are. You're a child of God. You have a new nature. I want, you, I want to teach you how to behave that way. I want to teach you how to have healthy interpersonal relationships. I want to teach you how to communicate right. I want to teach you how to think right. I want to teach you how to forgive and to reconcile. I want to teach you all these things. And so we're, the scriptures are full of instruction along those lines. That's what we find throughout the whole New Testament. And as we look at the context specifically for the book of Ephesians, we're going to end up in chapter 6. This is where we're given instruction about the spiritual warfare that we're in. Remember, there's five and a half chapters that come before Ephesians 6, chapter, or verses 10 through the end of the chapter. And so those five and a half chapters pretty much describe what I just described to you, how we're, we're saved by grace through faith. We're dead in our trespasses and sin, and God came and we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. We're made, uh, we're redeemed by the Son. We're chosen by the Father. Uh, we're reconciled with God and other people. And then he goes on to instruct us now again, same thing. Now that you're this new creation, children of God, this is how you behave. And it's a list of, hey, don't lie anymore, but speak truth. And um, don't be unforgiving, but forgiving. Don't be wrapped up into bitterness, but be edifying and encouraging. And so goes through this list of don't behave this way anymore because that's your behavior, the old man. Behave this way now because this is the new creation. And then he ends at the end. So the greatest enemy we have is really the old appetites that we have, the selfish desires. The Bible calls the flesh, the way we think opposed to God. And so we go through this process of having to learn how to deny or crucify those desires, that old man, and to walk in the new behavior of the new person that we are. And then he adds at the end, and don't forget, you have an external enemy who's trying to stop this work from happening. That's important to understand. That's the nature of spiritual warfare. The enemy simply just wants to get you in your flesh. He wants to get you to behave like your old nature. Those, those ways you have trained, the way your heart deviates towards without God, he wants you to get in the flesh and behave that way. All the things that God says, don't do those things anymore. Satan's trying to get you to do those things through many tactics, through deception and lying and, and distortion. He's always trying to get you confused, get you to justify behaving that way again. And that's his goal. And that's important because some people think the nature of the warfare is to fight Satan. And they think, I get saved, now I'm in the army of God. Now, and, and then they're out there and they're proclaiming scripture out into the air and they're rebuking Satan and the power of Satan. Uh, but then they go off into their own personal lives and they're all carnal and compromising and, and sinful. Satan's already won that war in that person's life. It, Satan's got him confused. They don't even know the nature of the war. They think they're out there fighting Satan when Satan is just trying to get them into their flesh and they are giving in because they've been distracted with the nature of that. So that is really... The nature, or that's why we're in a warfare, that's the goal of the enemy. Our goal is just to stand against the enemy, we're going to see, so we can finish the work, that so we can continue that work of transformation into the image of Christ and helping others do the same thing. We saw a beautiful illustration of this in Nehemiah, that's why we're kind of going to go there in our Wednesday night Bible studies. But in we looked a little bit in chapter 4, and chapters 4 to 6 in Nehemiah, really breaks down a lot of the attacks of the enemy, and so we're going to see that as we go through that book of Nehemiah on Wednesdays. But we see that they too were called to a great work, and they were called to rebuild the physical walls of Jerusalem. And that was going to bring protection from their enemies, security to the city, value back to the city and to the community. They could actually store valuables again if they rebuild the walls. And as soon as they started to do that, the enemy came out of the woodwork with a vengeance. And he said, I need to stop this work because I need to control them. 
And when they have walls, I can't control them anymore. And so he came out to, a, to attack that work that God had called them to do. And the same thing with us. When we lived in the world, we lived in insecurity, uh, no value, no purpose in life. We were enemies of God. Satan, is, he just wants to keep us there. He wants to keep us miserable, spiritual poverty, um, spiritual insecurity. He wants to keep us in that place. So as soon as we come to Jesus... And Jesus starts doing that work in our life of changing us and bringing health and security uh, and purpose as far as serving for his kingdom. Oh, man, the enemy wants to come against that. And so he will use certain tactics to make sure that we don't progress far in that, in that work that God has called us to. And again, here's the great news is that enemy is defeatable. Satan is a defeatable enemy. Uh, because of the resources that God has given us. So he says, God says, if you do what I'm going to tell you to do, you will be able to stand and finish the work. Continue to be transformed, not get, let Satan get to your flesh and make you sin against me. So then we ended up going to Ephesians chapter 6, and we read 10 to 13. I'll read those again to you guys. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the deception of the, end of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore. Notice a common word in there, stand, stand, stand. And so our purpose, our goal in this warfare is just to be able to stand or resist what the enemy is trying to do. We learned a little bit about the nature of our enemy. We looked here, we see the wiles of the devil. We looked at other scriptures, John 8, 44. And one of the main characteristics of Satan is he's a liar. He's the father of lies, the originator of lies. That's his very nature. It's the antithesis of God. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The nature of God is truth. The nature of Satan is lies and deception. This is going to be a big thing in all the armor. This is his main characteristic, and from it flows all of his attacks. He is a deceiver of truth. And so he'll either distort truth, contradict truth, withhold truth, twist truth, or flat out tell bold-faced lies. And so whichever works he will manipulate it masterfully to try and confuse or derail or redirect you. We also learn that he's an accuser of the brethren. He's false accusations, true accusations. He's always trying to bring an accusation against us. We see that through Scripture. We see that through examples of Satan and his warfare through Scripture. We saw it in Sanballat and Tobiah, just a different ways. He's always trying to accuse us. We saw in the book of Acts a few weeks ago with the enemies of the apostles. We saw it with the enemies of Jesus. It's just a tactic of the enemy to accuse and to lie. Then we saw what his desires were, which we've quoted a few times. His desires to devour you. His desires to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take things that don't belong to him. God promises you peace and joy and patience and love spiritual health. He promises you these things, and Satan wants to take those things that belong to you and take them away. And so we see there's a seriousness to this warfare. It's nothing to take lightly. We don't want to overemphasize it because Scripture doesn't. Scripture reminds us of it. We're not to blame Satan for everything. We're not to fear Satan in that sense, uh, but we are to acknowledge we're in a warfare and his desire. If I'm not ready, he will seek to take, steal, kill, and destroy my life and everything that's part of it. A couple other things that we looked at was how we need to put on his strength. Before we put on the armor, we have to put on his strength. And, and here's an important thing. We're going to see that everything, like the, we don't put on the strength just to put on the armor. We're already told to put on the strength of the Lord earlier in the book of Ephesians. We're told we're sealed with the Spirit of God until the day of redemption when we place faith in Christ. Jesus, or Paul goes on to pray in chapter 1, I want you to understand the surpassing greatness of the power that resides within you, the same power that rose Christ from the dead and seated him above all the enemies that are listed here in chapter 6. He goes on in chapter 5 to say, be ongoingly filled, ongoingly under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about the results of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so 
Putting on the power of God is not new to just spiritual warfare. It's not like we live the Christian life without God's power, and then all of a sudden we have to put it on when we're for and only for warfare. We put it on to put on the elements of the warfare. The other part of that, too, is we're going to see in the book of Nehemiah, when they understood they were in a warfare in chapter 4, they were confused and discouraged. They just thought they were rebuilding a wall. And so when the enemy came at them and wanted to kill them, they were ready to quit. And so Nehemiah had to grab their attention and say, look, we're not just part of a work, we're part of a warfare. And there's a lot at stake. You just can't walk away now. If you walk away, the enemy is going to come in. We're, we're building these walls to prevent the enemy from coming in. If you just walk away, your kids are going to die. Your wives are going to die. We're all going to die if we don't finish this wall. There's too much at stake. We have to do the work. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to rally together. We're going to get certain people with, with weapons on the watch. And all of you that are at work now, not only are you going to carry your, wep, your, your tool for the work, you're going to carry a weapon for the warfare. And so they had... Both their hands occupied. Now what's interesting is that they miraculously accomplished more now with limitations than they did before they had limitations because they recognized they were in a war. They recognized the urgency of it, and they went to work even with a limitation of now having one hand tied to a weapon. What's interesting with that is we notice we don't have that in our warfare. First, we need to understand we're in a warfare because we don't, just like them, we'll get discouraged and want to quit. But once we understand and we understand all that's at stake, then we need to engage in this warfare. But the great thing is we don't have to pick up two sets of things. We don't have to pick up a tool for work and a tool for warfare. It's the same tool. We use it for both. And so all the things that are mentioned in Scripture, like truth and you know the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, Shouting your feet with the preparation of the gospel, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. These are all mentioned earlier in the book of Ephesians. This is all part of the work that God is doing in my life. To be conformed to the image of Christ, to be a disciple of Christ, I need to walk in truth. We're going to talk about that in a moment. To, to, to be a disciple of Christ, I need to walk, understand God's righteousness and walk in his righteousness that he's provided. And it goes on down the line. Each of the elements of our warfare are the same elements we use for the work of discipleship that God has put. So that's the great thing. It's not like God is saying, okay, I'm going to give you all of these things as far as how the work is to be done, to be a disciple. And then when you got all those down, I'm going to pile a bunch of new things on you to try and learn and master for the warfare. He goes, no, it's one of the same thing. As I walk in truth as a disciple of Christ, not only am I being changed into the image of Christ, I'm being protected from the attacks of Satan. When I walk in the righteousness that God has provided as part of a disciple of Christ and being conformed in the image of Christ, I'm, it's actually a shield against the attacks of the enemy in that area of my life. And so that's the good thing. We just put on truth and righteousness and salvation, and it does double work. It changes us, and it protects us against the enemy. What we're going to learn as we look at these weapons, not so much of a new thing to put on, but the element of how it protects us against Satan and how he might attack us in that area of our lives as far as truth, righteousness, and so forth. So again, we're called to put on the whole armor of God, and again, so that we're able to stand, not to fight Satan, but to finish the work that God has called us to. So today, we're going to just cover one verse, verse 14, and we're going to look at two elements of the war, of the, of the armor, Truth and righteousness. Again, the focus is in a belt, a breastplate, and a shield, and a helmet. Those are just terms to help us remember what these things are. The focus is on truth and righteousness, salvation, the gospel, faith. That's the thing we're to put on, not belts and breastplates, which is a good thing because we'd be hard pressed to find a whole lot of scripture about belts and breastplates as far as, okay, yeah, oh, what's a breastplate? I don't know. I found like three scriptures with breastplates. That doesn't give me much instruction. But if I want to find out about truth and righteousness, it's in just about every page of the Bible. I have plenty of information and instruction about how to put truth on, how to put righteousness on. These are great instructions that were given and themes throughout all of scripture. So the purpose of physical armor I'll ask you guys, what's the purpose of physical armor? Why would a soldier put armor on, especially the kind that we're looking at here in the first century? What's armor do? 
Protects us, right? Protects us from who? The person I'm fighting, it's an enemy, all those things, right? Because here's my body, and if the enemy gets to my body, I'm dead, right? <laughs> they have a sword or a spear or something in their hand, and if that weapon touches my body, I'm dead. It's going to pierce me or pierce my heart or my lung. So the armor is there to prevent the enemy from getting to my body. And that's the same thing spiritually as this analogy is that the armor of God is a barrier to prevent the enemy from getting to really my flesh, right? Now, the enemy doesn't want to kill my flesh. I wish he did. That, wouldn't that be helpful if the enemy helped me die to my flesh? But the enemy wants to revive my flesh. He wants to kill my spirit. He wants to kill my connection with the Lord and my sensitivity or surrender to his spirit within me. He wants me in my flesh. And so he wants to get to my flesh, not to kill it, but to revive it and stir it and justify it and get me to act on it. That's his goal. And the armor is a barrier from that happening. And so that's kind of the flow even of these last three chapters of the book of Ephesians has been, hey, put this off and put this on, put this off and put this on. Now he's saying how the enemy wants to flip that around. He wants you to put off the things of God and put on the behavior of the old man. He wants you to lie. He wants you to get selfish. He wants you to not forgive. He wants you to get into bitterness. He wants you to gossip and be malicious. He wants to stir all those things in our life that God is trying us to get us to deny and put on the things that are in keeping with the Lord. So now we start in verse 14 here, and it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So again, the main character of Satan is what? He's like, I need to hear more people say, tell me that. You guys got to remember that. What's the main characteristic of Satan? He's a liar. That wasn't very convincing, but it's okay. We'll, we'll work on that. So he's a liar. He's a deceiver. So no wonder the first piece of thing armor were to put on is truth. Truth is the foundation, actually, for all the other elements of the armor. Truth is huge, as we just mentioned, in both the work and the warfare. Truth is the nature of God. And again, all the other elements are based on truth. Truth, again, is critical to understanding what biblical righteousness is, what salvation, what faith, what the gospel. Without truth, we don't understand any of the other elements of the, of the armor that we're to put on. If we don't understand those things, Satan will come in and distort those things. We won't put it on right, and he'll get right in there and mess us up and confuse us and condemn us or get us full of pride or whatever else. So truth is critical as part of all these. The enemy, again, will lie in all these areas. The way to expel a lie from any situation is to speak the truth. The way to expel Satan from any situation is to speak absolute truth. As we speak truth, if there's any deception, we give Satan an opportunity to be in that situation. This is interesting because last week we looked at chapter 2 of Ephesians. You could turn there. Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses. I'm going to read those again because we learn a little bit about the relationship of Satan, the flesh, and the world and how he plays on those things to accomplish his goal. He says, and, he made, and you he made alive, speaking of God to us, you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that deadness just means absolute separation from God's presence. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so we're going to refer back to those verses in a moment when it comes to righteousness. But the way especially verse, verses 2 and 3 are structured, it's, like, it's worded like this. Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he constructs the world system, the philosophy, the thinking of the, system, of the world that we live in to cater and try and tap into our flesh and our selfish desires to get us to live in those things. Before Jesus, that's just how we, we operated. We were fully into the world system and how it thought, its justifications, entitlements. You all go on down the line. The way the world philosophy was structured, it was set up that way by Satan to appeal and cater to our flesh and get us into it. 
But the Bible says you were dead in those things, but now God has made you alive. And so, again, that's the call not to be that way. But this is a great example, the topic of truth. Maybe more than any other topic, how Satan has structured our current world's thinking and system to attack truth, hasn't it? Isn't that a big issue in our world today is moral relativism? And your truth is true for you. My truth is true for me. But you can't tell me what is true or not true. I own my own truth. And you've got to speak your own truth. Truth is truth. It's either right or it's wrong. But the world we live in, Satan has crafted our world as an attack on, on knowing absolute truth and what truth is, and specifically moral and spiritual truth. And so we, we, the, only, the only offense in this world is if you tell somebody else their truth is wrong. You could believe whatever you want. I could personally believe whatever I want, and the world would be fine with it. But once I dare try and say to somebody else, your truth is not truth, your truth is wrong, then they go off the hinges, right? And so there's been a real attack on truth in our world today, and we see that's because it's been greatly influenced by the crafter of our world, the world system, which is Satan, who's a, a, the father of lies and deception. So as we kind of look at this, again, I don't want to get too much into the belt and the breastplate and the helmet. Those, again, are just illustrations to help us remember to put this armor on and what it might look like. But in this case, the belt is a good representation of what truth or the lack of it does in our lives. The belt was worn by a soldier under their armor over a garment. They had a long robe underneath their armor. And so when they didn't have their armor on, they would just walk around in this robe. That was their like attire that they would wear, casual, free. And so they could just walk around with those things. So when they girded themselves for war, when they wanted to put their armor on, they would lift the robe up. They would secure it around their waist, and they would use the belt to hold in all the loose pieces of this this robe so that it would be tight against their body so they could put their armor on. If any of it were left hanging, it would either trip the soldier up, it would hinder their mobility. You can't really run if a robe is down around your, even your knees or partially blocking your stride. So it would have to be up high so it wouldn't obstruct their mobility and, uh, and the, uh, or trip them up. And if there was any piece of fabric left hanging, it would make a great handle for the enemy to hold on to and manipulate or control you, either pull you down or take as an advantage in, in fighting against you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it was a really big deal to make sure that that robe was brought up tight, securely fastened with a belt, and it held all things together so it wouldn't trip you up or give the enemy something to hold on to to bring you down. And what a great description of truth in our lives or the lack there of it in our lives. If we don't have truth, any lies or deception in our life, it, it either will trip us up or it will give the enemy an opportunity to hold on and manipulate you in life. So there's two ways, really, that the enemy attacks in the area of truth here as far as the armor. The first is he tries to attack our understanding of truth. And the second, by getting us to lie personally, not to practice truth. So there's two ways then to protect ourselves against the enemy or to apply truth to our life. The first is to know and understand truth. And the second is to live and practice, speak truth and uh, strive for truth. Both these things are in the book of Ephesians. They're actually throughout all of scripture. But as we just look again at the context of Ephesians, that Paul is writing this in, and, the, and really the context of truth that now he's telling us to put on at the end of the book to protect ourselves, we see the first, the understanding of truth, is taught throughout, il illustrated throughout the whole book of Ephesians, and we'll see that in a second. The second element, as far as our need to speak and live in truth, is directly taught multiple places in the book of Ephesians. So both of these ideas of understanding truth and speaking truth or living in truth are taught here. So the first, again, understanding truth, we need to read and understand, obviously, God's word. We need to really be in and fully understand. As we look at Ephesians here, what are some of the great truths? This is one of the most solid doctrinal books in scripture. This is a, a, a letter that was written to an, a very mature church. There's no correction in this book. Paul wrote this. He spent over three years in Ephesus. He taught them seven days a week 
multiple hours, about four to five hours a day. This was an extremely mature church. And so Paul taught very profound doctrinal issues to this church in his letter here. And so in this letter, he teaches them things like um, the, our relationship with the Lord, the nature of God, the nature of our relationship with God. Chapter 1 is a really powerful book about the Trinity and our salvation, the election of the Father, the redemption of the Son, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It just starts off big that way, these deep kind of uh, doctrinal issues about our relationship with God and who God is goes on to talk about things, about our resources that God has given us, instruction on how to live, what is right and wrong by God, how to have certain types of interpersonal relationships and marriage and parent-child and all these different types of things are all shared through the book of Ephesians. And if we don't understand those things, the nature of God, the nature of our relationship with God, how we're supposed to live and conduct ourselves, all those types of things, Satan will fill those gaps in. And guess what he'll fill them in with? Distortions and lies. And that's, what, that's, that's why it's so imperative that we have this foundation of truly understanding what God teaches about all these issues here. Because Satan will fill that, get, get that gap in to confuse us and get us twisted around. If we have that, it's going to affect. If we don't have a proper understanding of God, it's going to distort our relationship with God. If we don't understand how we relate to God by grace, through faith, what he's provided, it will distort our relationship and interaction with God. If we don't understand his instruction on how to live, we will live an unhealthy spiritual life. The decisions we make, the way we think, all those things will be distorted if we don't have a proper understanding of truth in these issues. And so we see this often. I see this all the time, even within the church. But the enemy will lie about the nature of God to, to extremes. On one side, he'll say, well, God is far off. God is harsh. God is performance-based. Man, you got to carry your weight. When you come to Jesus, you need to perform. And the blessings that God gives you are related to how much you serve, how much you commit, how much you follow. If you don't toe the line, then God will be at odds with you. You won't have favor with God. And it's almost like my salvation, I'm never secure in it. It's always a question. It's always performance-based. I'm always trying to live up to my relationship with God. That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan. And a lot of people in the church have that burden that they're trying to do, and it distorts their whole life. It distorts how they relate to God. It distorts them enjoying and experiencing God's love and grace. It distorts so many things because of their lack of knowledge of the true in, uh, nature of God in our relationship with him. On the other side of it, there's this God of love. And God just will accept you. God will never judge you for who you are. You just be who you are, and God will love and accept you. You don't have to change. You don't have to do anything about it, because what kind of a loving God would judge you for who you are? That's unkind and un unloving. That's a distortion. That's a lie, right? A God is the perfect balance of love and justice, of grace and righteousness. And so he balanced those things together. And so he'll, the enemy will always try and lie to us to get us to bend one way or the other instead of walking in the balance of the full nature of God. And so we need, as every Christian, not just pastors or theologians, to have that basic understanding of all these truths, of our, the relationship with God, who God is, and enjoy his love, his grace, but also his righteousness and justice. This idea here of girding your loins in Scripture speaks of preparing for action. And so it could really read, prepare yourself with truth, is what this verse means. Prepare yourself with truth. That's a defense against Satan. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. We're all called to rightly divide and understand and apply the word of God. So this is one way that the enemy attacks. This is one way we need to put on truth to protect ourselves, is to be consumed with God's word and his truth, to seek to understand it, so that when he lies to us, even this morning I was doing that on the way here, the enemy was just filling my head with a bunch of lies, and finally I stopped and go, like, this is dumb. This is exactly what I'm studying here. So I just started proclaiming truth. I just started walking through all the truths of Scripture, my relationship with God, my position in Him, and it, and it all dissipated as I was just coming and declaring those truths. And so what a powerful tool the truth is. This is also how we grow in the work 
of, being, of discipleship and being conformed to the image of Christ, to study, study and meditate on the Word of God. How else are we going to know what needs to change and what God wants me to do and the work that He has in my life if I'm not in His truth and in His Word constantly? The second way to put on truth, to protect us, is to speak truth. Now, this gets back to really the work. This is the action of discipleship. The very nature of God is truth. And so to be a child of God is I want to be a child of truth. And so I need to love and embrace. I want to learn and understand. I want to live and think, speak truth, because that's who God is, and that's important to him. So to put truth on means that we don't just know it, but that we speak and think it. Again, the book of Ephesians is our context. Chapter 4, verse 14 says that speaking the truth in love is the mark of maturity when we learn to do both those things. And so some people with arrogance say, like, I just say it how it is, right? With no love, um, it, they just want to share what's on their mind. Usually those people, though, don't say it all like it is, just what's convenient when they roll their head like that, right? Uh, then there's those that don't speak any truth in the name of love right? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to, to offend anybody. But is, is holding back truth really the loving thing to do? And so speaking the truth in love, and first of all, always my love or commitment to God, my love and commitment for that person. If, that's, if I'm truly loving and committed to both of them, then I'm going to speak truth because it's what's going to bring health and righteousness to them, to the Lord, and honor him. We're just directly commanded in chapter 4, verse 25, a few verses later on, that we're to stop lying and put on truth. That's part of being the new man or new creation. We're just supposed to be children of truth. God puts a high priority on truth. We've talked about this many times. Again, I just quoted the nature of, of God, of Jesus in John. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We can't marginalize that. It's the very nature and character of God. We're sealed with the Spirit of God. We're children of that same God. And so we should love and put a high priority on truth. Satan is always trying to marginalize, minimize, and distort that. He says, oh, come on. Don't be such a stickler. Don't be such, such a legalist. You know, what's a little white lie or a little distortion? Or, or don't be so hard. No, truth's a big deal. I should really love and prioritize it, even if it's inconvenient and it, it brings maybe heartache for me or makes life more difficult, I'm going to speak truth because I want to be pleasing to the Lord and I'm his child. We should put a high priority on it. He'll always try and get us again to be a little deceptive here or there, to exaggerate a story, to, um, to marginalize this. So it's always for various reasons, usually for selfish reasons, right? To, for self-protection, for, self, for our image sake, self-promotion, whatever it is, usually dealing with myself, He'll tap into that and be like, well, if you say the truth here, man, it's going to make things a lot worse. And if you say the truth here, man, just a little twist. Just withhold that information and you'll get a promotion. You don't have to tell him that you messed up here or there. And so he's always trying to get us to compromise just a little bit here and there. Again, any victory he has in this area is a victory. And so as we seek to speak in truth and live in truth, again, it's part of putting that new character on. When we speak the truth, it holds everything together, like the belt of truth. When we speak the truth, it holds everything in our life together. You guys know. You guys have lied before, right? When you tell lies, man, it makes life much more complicated, doesn't it? You've got to remember the lies that you told. You've got to remember who you told them to. You've got to now tell other lies to back that lie up. Because Satan will get in. He'll capitalize on that. He'll say, oop, there's a lie. I'm going to crack this baby open, right? And so he's going to bring as much attention to that lie as possible because he wants to, to make you lie more and more and live in that lie and use that lie to destroy your life. And so the need for truth is huge. huge. Lies and deception will always trip us up and always give the enemy something to hold on to and control us in our life. And again, if you want to expel Satan from any situation, you speak 100% truth. Somebody once told me that 99% of the truth is still 100% lie. Even if we have a little slight untruth in there, a lie is a lie. There's a 100% lie in there. And so that's a high standard. And I, I encourage you, I challenge you to even evaluate yourself. You'd be amazed at how often we exa exaggerate or embellish or do whatever. You always, you never, you know, we exaggerate these truths um, 
or we exaggerate these things, and it makes it a manipulation of truth. And so we have to be really careful and really examine and examine yourself. You got to be met with grace, though, because trust me, as you do this, you'll see ah, you failed this week because we they're just in our nature that we deviate towards those types of things. Another thing with truth is not only does he want us to get to get us to speak lies, believe lies. Um, indoctrinally, but also he wants us to believe and get into lies or distortions of truth, especially about other people. That's part of human nature, sadly, but that's a tactic Satan will use. Something about our human nature, we just love to render judgment, don't we? We just love to jump on and we'll hear half of the story, one side of the story, some of the truth, and we just already start judging, rendering decisions, accusing people, in our head and in our mind and making decisions. And the Bible says, man, we need to suspend judgment until we have all the facts. Scripture says that what love believes all, love hopes all. And so we should operate out of love instead of deviating to or going to the worst in people. And I bet they meant this. And I, they probably said it for this reason. And I believe it, even though I've never talked to them about it before, right? We'll hear one side of the story and not the other, and we render judgment. That's sinful. The Bible says we're, we're to call to suspend judgment until we have both sides of the matter. And so that's something the Lord is showing me more and more and more, even about myself. And man, I'm like thinking, man, it's taking me 30 years in my walk with the Lord, but that's such a big issue. And I see it all over the place with many Christians and believers, our rush to judgment on limited facts. And Satan, trust me, I know each of you could relate. How many times have you rendered judgment? You've thought this way about a person, only later to talk to them and find out the rest of a story, and you're like, oh, I didn't know that that's why you did it, or I didn't know that's what happened. That changes the whole thing. That's all the enemy trying to get in there, and my flesh that wants to bite and own it and live in that as well. And so that's one area as well. We have to show maturity and walk in truth. If I don't have all the truth, I have to suspend judgment. And the enemies, especially in the day and age we live in today, judgment with social media and all these things, we, we just want to render judgment. We want, we want it now. And so if we can't get all the facts, just something in us, like, I need them. I, I, I need to know everything, and I deserve to render judgment, and we feel entitled to that. So again, a very dangerous thing that, as believers, we need to not bite on because that's a tactic of Satan as well. So now practically to put on the belt of truth, means to know and apply the truth of God's word in every situation. The enemy's always trying to twist the circumstances and our thinking uh, to get us confused. Second, make truth a priority in our lives. Understand its, com uh, its importance and commitment to speaking it. And lastly, we as believers have to create an environment for truth. That means that a person, we have to be able to handle truth. And so we have to let people know that you speak truth and I will take it, or we'll pray about it, uh, but we can handle it. A lot of people say, like, well, just tell me the truth. Tell me the truth, and then they do, and we just slit their throats, right? And like, I'm never telling you the truth again, right? And so we have to create an environment where people are able to speak the truth, um, and then we'll see truth in our lives. So now we move on here to the breastplate of righteousness. And again, since the enemy is a liar and deceiver, he's going to lie to us about what righteousness is. That's why, again, it's so important to understand the scriptures and what biblical righteousness is. He'll attack us here in two ways. And both of these ways are an attempt to get us away from God. He'll either get us into self-righteousness or into condemnation. Self-righteousness means that we aren't that reliant upon God, and we don't need God, and so we're self-sufficient or we're okay enough. And so it makes us less reliant on God's mercy and his grace and his provision the other end is self-condemnation, right? Or condemnation that, man, we're just a jerk, we're a loser, we're a bad Christian, we're not worthy of anything. And what does condemnation do? I just withdraw into a hole. I, don't, I can't approach God. I don't want, I, 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 if I'm around him, I'll just get blasted by his truth in his life. And so we withdraw from God. And so either condemnation or right, self-righteousness, he'll try and lie to us in those two areas. So first, to deal with self-righteousness, we just go back to those verses we read a few moments ago. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and so we were completely separated from God, and so we're in complete need of the Lord. And it says that we walked in the lust of our flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of our mind. And so that's our state without God. We are completely uh, filthy, completely unrighteous. Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, not one. And so none of us is righteous on our own. And so whenever we start feeling or comparing ourselves to others and thinking that we're good enough as believers or unbelievers, um, that's a lie. And so we are completely dependent upon God. We have no righteousness in ourselves at all. That's another thing as we look at the way the world system is going to that issue of righteousness. That's another lie. Very close to truth. Your truth is your truth, but also your righteousness is your righteousness. You decide what's right for you uh, and wrong for you, but nobody else can tell you that. That's a lie too. God is the creator of the universe. He's the judge. He made the moral law as well as all the other laws that govern us in our universe. He determines what's right and wrong. He calls some things right and some things wrong. And so what is right is righteous. What is wrong is unrighteous. And so he's the one that dictates righteousness or not. We need to understand his standard. And as we do, we realize we fall very short of his standard of righteousness. And so understanding these things prevents an attitude of self-righteousness. And as believers, that's why it's so important to often go into the presence of the Lord, to recognize who, who he is, how righteous and holy he is, because that keeps us in a place of humility and dependence upon the Lord and away from being self-righteous. If we don't go to the presence of the Lord often, then we slowly start comparing ourselves to other people. We slowly start comparing ourselves even to how we used to be or how bad we could be, and we start feeling like we're good enough. But the more we come into the presence of the Lord, a healthy reminder, not a condemning, but a healthy understanding of truth, which is my dependency and need for God all the time. Now, the enemy has lied to the world about this because most in this world think they're righteous enough, and so they don't see a need for a Savior. Hope I think everybody in this room has recognized that. At one point, we've recognized how sinful we are and how we are in need of a Savior and have received him. But be careful because the enemy will continue to attack in this area even after salvation to get you more and more dependent upon yourself and less and less dependent upon the Lord, and that's just priming us for failure. The other way Satan attacks is the other direction. Once sometimes we get into, now I don't have a problem with that. I know I'm weak. I know I'm a jerk. I'm constantly failing. I'm no good. I can't even come into the presence of the Lord. He, the enemy is there to try and condemn you, trying to magnify your failures, trying to magnify your weaknesses and sin. And so um, that's another way that Satan will condemn us. So the answer to that Again, is truth, is understanding God's word. And how do we obtain our righteousness? Not by works, not by living the, the, a certain way. We get it only from the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no, righteous, or knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus lived a completely righteous life, and when we receive him as Lord and Savior, he gives us his righteousness. That's our standing before the Lord. That's an important concept to understand, is I need to know that I'm righteous only through faith in Christ. These very same thing in the book of Ephesians, the first three verses we read over and over, we're dead in our trespasses and sins and so forth, showing us how bad we were. The very next section talks about how we're saved by grace through faith, not by works of our own, only by God. And so that's what we have to understand. I don't stand... So that way, when the enemy comes and says, you're weak, just like Sam Ballot, remember in Nehemiah chapter 4, you're weak, you don't know what you're doing, you don't have the right resources, you're going to try and be a disciple of Christ, you're going to be trying to conform to the image of Christ, what a joke, you don't even know what you're doing. That's what they said to, Sam, that's what Sam Ballot said to Nehemiah about their work, and that's what Satan says to us many times to condemn us. And you know what we say is, you're right, I am weak, I don't know what I'm doing, I can't be conformed to the image of Christ, I can't learn to obey and walk in obedience of all that Christ commanded. I can't help others do the same. I can't even do it for myself. And, but just like Sam Ballot, what did he do? He told part of the truth, but not the whole truth. The rest of the truth overrode that truth. The rest of the truth was, but this is God's work and God is with you. And that's the same thing with us is to know the full truth. I can't in my own strength live righteously. I can't in my own strength do the work. I can't be and make disciples. I can't be conformed to the image of Christ. But God is with me. His Spirit is in me, and He's enabled me to do this. And so I have to declare the rest 
of the truth to counteract that. And so walking in that full knowledge of righteousness. And so again, having that true understanding of what it is, how I fall short, but how God gives me his righteousness when I receive it, uh, defends against these attacks of the enemy. And like the belt of truth is I don't just understand to protect me from the attacks, but I put it on and wear this as part of the new man. That's what we were just talking about. So not only does Jesus give me his righteousness and right standing, but now he gives me the ability to live a righteous life. He's made me a child of God. So God has freed me from the unrighteous nature. Romans 6 tells me that, that he's uh, made me a new creature. He's freed me from that old unrighteous man so that I can now walk in the right works of the Father. He's filled me with his righteous Holy Spirit to empower me to live a right life, and he's given me his righteous word to instruct me on what right and wrong is. So before, the Bible says, I didn't have a choice. I sinned because I was a sinner. I was lost. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. Now I'm a child of God filled with his spirit. His word opened up to me. He's empowered me and will be with me to conform me into the image of Christ and live a right life. So now as Christians, we're free to live the way that God intended us to live and to please him. And that's one way. Some of us read that and be like, what a burden. Now I have to live righteously? No, it's the other way around. Before I didn't have a church, I mean, it didn't have a chance. Now I'm able to live righteously. Before I couldn't. And so now as believers, we're able to live rightly in this life. So we, when we walk around in a matter, again, of righteousness, then that protects us against legitimate accusations that the enemy might make against us. If we live in unrighteousness, if we get into the behavior of the old man, then the accuser of the brethren will jump all over that and bring a legitimate accusation against us to tarnish our witness, to condemn us. And so we have to protect against that. So as we close and wrap up on those two elements, on truth and righteousness, let's recap a bit. So we, we seek, again, to know and apply the truth of God's word in every situation of life. That protects us against the attacks of Satan to confuse and frustrate us. He'll seek, he'll, he'll, if we don't have truth, he'll fill in a lie. And that, again, will distort what the truth is. And so we want to know truth, particularly scriptural truth, that protects us against the lies the enemy will try and tell us. And then we seek to, to speak truth all the time because that expels Satan and his influence from any situation. When it comes to righteousness, as I seek to understand the truths of biblical righteousness and how I'm unrighteous, that prevents against self-righteousness. And as I understand how I obtain righteousness and how I can walk in righteousness, that prevents condemnation. And then I seek again to live a righteous life by the power of the Holy Spirit, which prevents a legitimate accusation from the enemy that could take my witness and condemn me and bring something against me. And so I pray we meditate on those things. We're going to enter into a time of communion now. But what a great thing to meditate on as we do communion, how the truth of God's word and the righteousness that God gives us as we partake of communion as a reminder of that. So let's pray and kind of apply these things in our own lives as we go before the Lord. So Father, we do thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, as we read your word, now we know what to put onto our lives. We know what to, to stand on. The enemy again wants to come in and tell us lies about you. He wants to tell us lies about our relationship with you. He wants to tell us lies about how we're saved and how we're righteous, and he wants to lie to us about all these things. So, Lord, I just pray that you would stir us and burden us, Lord, to seek truth, to know truth, to be in your word, to protect us. Not only, again, does this help us, instruct us on how to live, but it protects us against the lies that the enemy will tell us. And, Lord, when it comes to righteousness, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that although we're weak, although we're sinners, although we're insufficient, Lord, You've given us your righteousness. You've filled us with your spirit. You've instructed us through your word so that we're able to live a right life before you, Lord. We thank you that you've given us these things. And Lord, I just pray for anyone in here that, or even watching that just does not know these things. They don't, 
They haven't asked you into their heart, into their life, Father. They haven't asked you to forgive them. They haven't asked you to be their Lord and Savior. Um, They know about you. They come to church and hear about you, but they're actually not trusting, relying, allowing you to be their sustenance and whole meaning of existence, Father. And so you call for a deep belief, God. You call for a belief that goes beyond the mind but truly trusts you for everything, relies upon you for salvation. So, Lord, I just pray if anyone in here has been lied to, particularly about righteousness, if they're, if they're standing in their own righteousness before you, they won't stand before you on Judgment Day. I just pray that you open their eyes, Lord, to see their need for you, that they are sinners, they are without righteousness, and they need your righteousness, God. I pray for anybody in here, Lord, who's been lied to and is condemned, condemned to the fact of driving them away from you, that, Lord, you would share truth with them that you, you, your blood washes away all sin, that your blood will make them righteous, that you have taken their sins, all their failures that they did, you took on yourself. When you look at them, when they trust in you, when you look at them, they didn't do that anymore. Instead, they walked on water. They fed the multitudes. They had compassion and healed. The righteousness that you lived, the life that you lived is now put on us, and you look at us that way. So, Father, thank you that the perfection of the life of Jesus is what you see in our lives now after we trust in you. Lord, I just pray these things would set in. If there's lies from the enemy, I pray you would squash them. I pray that you would reveal full truth, that there would be full healing and health in our relationship with you, God. So we lift these things up to you. We ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, did... Anybody not get any communion elements? Frank? Okay, we'll get you. I have one extra one here. You guys all got one? Yes. Okay, cool. So we're going to sing a song right now. As you do, just kind of meditate on these things here. I'm going to come back up, and I'm going to share a little bit about communion, and then we're going to partake communion together, okay? Lift up my eyes to the heavens Cause I know where my help comes from I will set my mind upon you, Jesus My Savior's God's only Son There is peace for the seeker seeker. blessed hope hope from the Lord Lord. there is love love without measure measure. for all who trust in the Lord I lift up my eyes to the heavens Cause I know where my help comes from I will set my mind upon you, Jesus My Savior's God's only Son There is peace for the seeker Blessed hope from the Lord there is love without measure for all who trust in the Lord there is peace for the seeker blessed hope from the Lord There is love without measure For all who trust in the Lord For all who trust in the Lord For all who trust in the Lord For all who 
trust in the Lord. All right. And um, just read, I'm going to read from John chapter 6, a few verses here. But John 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. A few verses later, verse 51, it says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give to in is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So this isn't talking about communion. This is talking about Jesus. This is talking about his coming sacrifice on the cross. And so as he gives his life, uh, his body, his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, pointing to that communion, just remembers back to the cross. Here he's speaking of the work on the cross. But interesting analogy, this bread. And, and then he gets very detailed, but little strong words here that are, that are kind of jarring, I think, to the people that are listening in verse 53, he says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And so kind of strong language there to make his point, but full of analogies here. Um, and so he's, this, this whole idea of I am the bread of life, right? And so I am really, bread was a staple, it was what sustained them. And so it was a sustenance that carried them through. And they were looking for physical bread. He goes, no, I'm your spiritual life and sustenance in your life. And to eat something, to take something in was a common figure of speech, at the time, to like take it deep into your being, deep into your life. It's not a superficial thing. It's something you have to take in deep into your life here. So really, it's talking about not just superficial belief. He's talking about the extent of your belief. Now, in a little bit, anybody get hungry yet for lunch? No? A little bit. All right, thanks for your honesty. Okay, good. Anybody else? Maybe soon you will be. Let's just say by 1 o'clock right? You guys haven't eaten yet, and you're going to probably get, start getting hungry by one o'clock. I usually get really hungry after church. I don't eat much before. But let's just say you go out to a restaurant, and you go, and you pick up a menu, and you're really hungry at this time. Say, hey, man, the waiter's taking a while. It's almost two, and you haven't eaten all day. You're starving, right? And so you go, and you sit down and get the menu, and guess what? Reading that menu is not going to satisfy your hunger, is it? Just reading that menu. Right? If you ask the chef or you ask the waiter, can you tell me the ingredients of this dish? Learning the ingredients of the dish won't satisfy that hunger. Right? If they bring you a bowl of bread to satisfy you while you wait for your food and you just start playing catch with your kids with the bread, uh, throwing it around the room, that's not going to help your hunger either, is it? The only thing that's going to satisfy your hunger is to eat that bread and take it into you. Right? To learn about Jesus won't satisfy your hunger uh, to know about him, to come to Bible study. There's even people that get really into doctrine and dice up all these elements. The whole point Jesus is saying here, I'm not a topic for debate. It comes down to practically you need to really rely and deeply trust me. And that's what he's saying here. I don't want just a superficial, I believe in Jesus. He says, I need you to take me in, fully rely on me, and um, just trust in me with everything. And so Jesus has to be the sustenance of our life. Jesus has to be a deep reliance. We have to have a deep reliance upon him in every area of our life. And so that's a big challenge, I think, for each of us. And as we take this, this is why we could trust him. He gave us everything. He's given us everything materially and physically and spiritually. And so he has given us a future promise and a present hope right here. And so as we partake of this, we're not taking of his physical body and his blood, but we're remembering Verse 51, that sacrifice to give us eternal life that he did. So we have to place our full trust in, in everything in our life. I was just thinking about that this morning. Lord, what areas of my life am I not just totally reliant upon you? Am I not just seeking you for my sustenance and existence? And so I need to place my trust in him in all those areas of our life. That's what he calls us to. So, Lord, we do thank you, Lord. We lift up this bread, first of all. 
And it's just a cracker, Lord. But it reminds us this amazing fact that the God of the universe, the God who created everything, became a human being and walked this earth. As we read the Gospels, we get to hear how he spoke, how he interacted, his compassion, his care, his love, how he wept, how he laughed, how he talked with other people, Lord. God of the universe came and walked this earth, and then he took that body and he allowed it to be beaten and betrayed and stuck on a cross and um, died. That body died, Lord. And then, Lord, you became, we became your new body. And as we place faith in you, we have hands and feet and different parts of a body that is we're together. Now you're our head. So you sacrificed that physical body, Lord, that we would have, you would have a spiritual body. And so, Lord, I pray as we, we hold this cracker, it would remind us of that great sacrifice and that great promise, Lord, as we place our true faith, our reliance, our trust, and our hope in Jesus Christ, we will have eternal life and we will have an abundant life the more we trust you. So challenge us to faith this morning, Lord, to trust you, but, but faith has to be based in truth, the true Jesus of Scripture, Lord. So I just pray you continue to reveal that to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And Lord, now we hold this cup of juice, which represents your blood. And Lord, that blood represents your love and your forgiveness. Lord, you... the. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And so that sacrifice is the extent of your love. And Lord, this blood represents your forgiveness. And Lord, the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. If we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So first, Lord, I pray for those that are having a hard time receiving your love and forgiveness that, Lord, those truths would just ring out. It's not based on us, it's based on you. If we confess our sins, you forgive us. You clothe us in your righteousness, God. For those that are being condemned, I pray that that truth would be sweet on their lips as this juice, Lord, that they are forgiven and made righteousness, righteous in Christ. Lord, for those that are having a hard time <coughs> loving others and forgiving others, Lord, you set the standard as we remember your great love and your great forgiveness that now, Lord, you tell us to turn around and do the same thing, to love and to forgive. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us, and you, you challenge us, Lord, to forgive as, Christ, as God through Christ has forgiven us. So, Lord, teach us to love like you. Teach us to forgive like you as we remember what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now, Lord, we do just commit the rest of this day to you, Father. I pray, Lord, that we would not be forgetful hearers, that we would meditate today on truth, on righteousness, that we'd meditate on today, are we putting it on? Are we walking in it? Are we susceptible to the attacks of the enemy? Are there any areas we've been believed a lie? Are there any areas we are lying? Are there any areas we, we believe the lie of righteousness and we're self-righteous or living in condemnation? Are there any areas of our life where we're walking in unrighteousness? You're not here to beat us up, Lord. You're here to challenge us, to convict us, to urge us back to the place where we need to be. So we ask these things of you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, one more song? Yes, sir. Cool. Let's go ahead. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lifting our lives up each day. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In the words and in prayer, we'll stay. 
So let's stand our ground, make war in the spirit, cause the family's worth fighting for. As for me and my house, we will serve the As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, lifting our lives up each day. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, in the words and in prayer we'll stay. So let's stand our ground. Make war in the spirit, cause the family's worth fighting for. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let's stand our ground, make war in the spirit. Cause the family's worth fighting for As for me and my house As for me and my house As for me and my house We will serve the Lord God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.